Hello, friends. Thanks for tuning in. I'm really glad you could join us today. I have a guest today who um, I'm really excited he's with me because uh, this gentleman I met at the Barefoot Strong Summit in New York City a few months ago. And I have to tell you, when I went through his lectures at that summit, it explained a lot of mysteries that have come up in my life <laughs> about human movement. And so uh, my guest is a bodywork practitioner who specializes in myofascial release and structural integration. He's also a lecturer, a writer, and in fact, he's the author of this amazing book, which I really love, it's called Born to Walk. And if you don't have it, we'll talk about where you can get it. So I'm pleased to introduce my guest, James Earls. Thanks so much, James. Well, thank you, Carl. Thank you for the invitation and, and thanks for putting us together and for giving me the opportunity to be here. So it's, yeah, it's, it's taken us a while to get together, but here we are and I'm, I'm excited. Um, yeah, so I have to start off with a story. Um, Go ahead. Which can lead into our conversation here. So I met James, I met you at the late September Barefoot Strong Summit in New York City. And you started explaining some things about movement of various capacities and variables, uh, some of them between, let's say, men and women. Mm -hmm. So recently, during the holidays, my son and I are walking behind our wives. And my son, you have to realize, this guy, so I'll brag for a minute, he's an MD, he's a PhD, he's an elite athlete. I mean, when he does a Spartan race, he usually finishes like in the top 15, 20 people out of, let's say, 2,000. I mean, it, the guy's a beast, right? The guy can run fast. Yet, here we, are, here we are walking behind our wives. And we're like, how do they do it? How do they walk so fast? We can't keep up with them. I mean, and I thought of you because I'm thinking, Nick, I think it has to do with the hips. I'll talk <laughs> to James and we'll find out for sure. <laughs> Well, anyways, it's a story, but it's fun because really, it, I think that's, you really, you hit on something with that. So uh, yeah. I would love to talk about that. I'd love to talk about all the things that you're doing that you'd like to share with us. Um, t tell me a little bit, though, about this whole hip situation. Okay, cool. Um, well, I think there are, all of us have a different kind of... Um, almost kind of a, a resonant uh, rhythm whenever we're walking. And there are so many factors that are going to go into that. Um, there's leg length, um, hip uh, distance, so hip width. Um, that's going to be looking at pelvis width. Um, and a lot of it is also, um, we all have a different kind of elastic tuning to our tissues. You know, sure. so maybe, you're, you know, maybe your wife's more loosely or more tightly kind of put together. And yeah. so, you know, with all the, the hypermobility tests. So some of us are just a little bit more muscular, some of us are a little bit more elastic, some of us are very um, tightly bound, some more loosely bound. And so there are some kind of biomechanical um, factors and, and variables that be in it. And then there's also psychology. There's just, you know, what, what's your, your attitude about movement and what's your natural tendency? You know, we see people that are very, you know, and we were in New York, um, and it's fascinating, you know, New Yorkers are kind of, they're, they're direct, it's like, they're direct oh. in, in their talk, they're direct in their actions, and they're direct in their movement, so, and, and they have to be to survive, you know, it was, I, I remember, you know, I'm, I'm from a little town of, you know, 10,000 people on the edge of Belfast, Northern Ireland, which is why I have a slightly different, weird accent, and, um, but like, there, it was like, if you were at a, crossing and if there was one other person there it was like it was my, my goodness what what's that person doing at my crossing but in new york it's like it's like the stampede it's like that's the the migration across the serengeti um, yeah. <laughs> but you're not all going in the same direction you've got one herd going one way and the other herd coming the other way so you, you have to stand your ground you're oh, well, you're standing oh your ground, very much yeah going forward and um, so some of us are a little bit more laid back in our movement and our walking. Some of us go for a, you know for a, a, a saunter, and some of us kind of you know we were full on kind of pushing through it, and um, and and some of that is so the psychology. So and that's going to pretend to go back to whether we're using more of a muscular kind of pushing um, strategy or whether we're using more of a kind of a relaxed kind of elastic strategy, and you know it's all. There are so many variables that will go into to speed. Um, 
that it's kind of it's it's you know I would need to to see see what's happening with the wives and what's happening with the two of you and um, to be able to kind of go ah oh, okay well I think it's more of this variable or that variable um, but in whenever we're together in uh, September uh, one of the one of the th dynamics we're talking about which it's, it's kind of epidemic within a lot of the literature that women tend to have wider hips mm -hmm. and the literature would kind of lead to believe that the that actually gives less efficiency because they've got, they've got wider hips then they've got a kind of a wider lever whenever you're standing on one leg they have to support um, their body weight on a longer lever so that actually gives them more work to do but actually a um, combination of a couple of different um, uh, papers that would come out one from Dan Lieberman said well actually the thinking was wrong the calculations are wrong actually doesn't make them any less efficient at all um, and in another paper is actually saying, well, actually, some of the extra width of the hip may actually lead to more efficiency or a different type of efficiency. And um, yeah. allow, allows women or people with wider hips, let's just say, because there is an overlap, there's no absolute, there's no male pelvis. Sure, yeah. Pelvis. This is about width of pelvis. So actually having a wider pelvis allows people with wider pelvises to walk together and be happier at a kind of communal speed. So okay. with a more narrow pelvis, we have a, a narrow and um, happy speed. So if we have to walk more quickly or more slowly than our happy speeds, it costs us more energy. Uh, yeah, okay, sure. And for, if you have a narrow pelvis, you have a very narrow kind of um, efficient speed. Whereas with a wider pelvis, you've got a more of a um, kind of a, in that graph, you have a kind of a wider range at which you can still be kind of strolling along and being quite happy and still maintaining a, a chat. And, and you know, that, that could be more quickly or more slowly than, than our you know, narrow pelvis kind of bias. That's interesting. Um, this is kind of random. I, there are some musician friends of mine who, uh, so in my former life, I was a musician for a living. So, but uh, there was a very famous musician, Joe Zawinul is his name, from mm -hmm. Austria, actually. He was a jazz musician, uh, very successful. He passed away a few years ago. But I remember him talking about gait, and not in terms of biomechanics, but in terms of um, confidence, um, a, a lot of different things, um, whether they're angry, happy. Uh, and I actually, I hadn't planned on mentioning this or asking this question, but do our emo emotions have anything to do with our gait? Absolutely. Um, and I suppose you just take me back to a, an early, one of the, an early book that got me interested in complementary therapies um, I was originally, as a, as a teenager, I was in, in interested in astrology and tarot and kind of strange yeah. things. And um, one book, I think it was the, uh, the Psychic Explorer, and I was talking about the, the, the signs of the zodiac, and they suggested an experiment going for a walk with the attitude of the sun, so full of energy and brightness, and then going for a walk with the energy of the, I can't remember all the, the different energies of the planets, but going for a walk at like Mars. If you want to, if you want to survive in New York, you have to, you take on the, the kind of the, the warrior like kind of strength of yeah. Mars. And, you know, and then there's the, the, the more loose kind of um, rhythmic, maybe seductive movement of Venus. Okay. And we're saying, well, we can actually change our emotions by taking on these movement patterns. And of course, oh. this, this, this works both ways, that our movement will, will reflect our mood. You, know, you can tell, you know, maybe if, if you see your wife walking down the street at a distance, you know whether you're in trouble or not. Um, <laughs> sometimes okay. That actually it. explains something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thinking back to your mother or you know whatever. i was just doing that too i was just doing it yeah i remember 
Yeah, and it's, it's it's kind of it's a you know it is literally a two way street that our our emotions affect our movements, but we can also affect our emotions by by moving in a different way by moving in different characteristic, um, and you know that's some of the the attitude that we have to take on. And it's interesting we you know we use attitude in, in both those senses, attitude mm-hmm. mentally and attitudes physical. Interesting. I hadn't you know it's interesting. Uh, I sort of knew this, but. You just helped to explain it for me in, in, in a much more complete uh, um, summary. Like in the workshops that I teach, uh, the Parkinson's things, so we, we know, like, for example, um, in Parkinson's disease, a lot of times they'll have a more stooped over posture. You know, I, a lot of people do anyways. In fact, I do if I'm not careful. It's easy for me to be kind of forward, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm sitting a lot. I'm on planes a lot. I'm whatever. But... In Parkinson's, it tends to be a little more exaggerated, but also the number one non-motor symptom is depression. Mm -hmm. So depressed people don't usually walk with a really super upright posture and a confident gait. Um, But one of the things we've found to be helpful is uh, when we when we cue them into gradually we have kind of a process I like to go through to create more of a a gradual awareness of what they can be moving like versus what they usually move like and putting in some arm swing initiated from the shoulder joint, a little bit of reciprocal arm swing plus some trunk rotation automatically brings you a little bit more upright. And then when they walk more upright and I call it like walking like a badass or walking with an attitude because you, you can't, you're not going to walk around all upright if you're depressed, but if you can start to get into more upright position, velocity increases, usually stability improves a little. Um, mm-hmm. And you know what? They just start to feel a little bit better. Like, oh, yeah, this feels good. So that, that totally makes sense about how each one affects each. Yep. Right? Emotions affect movement. Movement can affect emotions. Yep, yep. Um, I mean, I'm bringing back memories again. Whenever I was studying as a as a kid for exams, um, I used to study late at night, and occasionally I couldn't to let myself go to sleep. Um, after studying, I had to go for a walk, and I had a recording of Isao Tomitas, um, who's kind of the Jean Michel Jarre um, kind of equivalent in Japanese. But he had uh, Holtz Planet Suite, all on synthesizer. So I used to go for a walk around just the countryside at two o'clock in the morning, listening to this, the, the Holtz Planet Suite. And I would sometimes go through those different kind of moods. So each planet had a different mood. And I'm kind of thinking of the, the Mars sequence and it's very, it's very martial, it's very upright, it's very confident, it's very strident mm-hmm. music. Mm-hmm. And again, we got that overlap of language and, and physicality, motion. To, to be strident, to, to stride out, to be strong. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm going a little off track here, but I'm going back to New York City because it's very interesting to see the difference in uh, different cultures and movement, uh, mm-hmm. cities and movement. Of course, you've seen that probably more than anyone. You do a lot of traveling. Quite a bit. Uh, I do a lot of traveling, but you, you go a lot of places. Yeah, thankfully I'm slowing down. <laughs> um yeah so it's interesting like in new york city you're right there's this herd thing and you stand you have to stand your ground the way you said that's so appropriate because otherwise you're going to get run over same thing when you're driving in new york city i mean <laughs> yes. you know that's why i take uber but uh or yeah. subway but um versus let's say going to uh pretty much anywhere else <laughs> <laughs> yes. right so yes. I guess that that kind of also uh, makes me wonder how much society has to do with movement. Like where you live, does that affect your your movement? Like subconsciously, you just take on certain movement of a certain where you are. Yeah, um, I you know oh, there's so much to talk about with that. Um, I once upon a time I was working with a a uh, another teacher, and he had a particular walk he's very very bendy but a very strong guy and he had a particular kind of wavy walk I mean, it, was, it was very particular to him and he had a he had a child a uh, little boy and we had a, a big meeting once and 
and we were kind of hanging out after the, the meeting in the bar and he was playing with this kid and eventually it was 8, 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. We went, okay, it's bedtime. And so we, we watched him leading his little boy across the dance floor and across kind of in front of the bar, back off to the hotel room. And you could see both of them moving in exactly the same particular way. So we, you know, there's a, there's a level of influences and the, in the style of you know, movement I want to, you know, as a kid, your, your input, how do I move? Well, it's kind of the first strongest influence is going to be parents. So I, I get to see my parents and you know, this is how we walk. And then, and then, you know, especially as teenagers, there was going to be a certain culture. And I don't know about your, whenever um, you were growing up, for me, it was kind of those mods and rockers. So kind of, you know, they had a different style of dress and a little bit of different movement. You know, as a, as a rocker, you had to have a certain, again, a certain attitude. Mm -hmm. and, and I grew up close to Belfast. Um, so we're, during the 70s and 80s, there was the, the, the troubles. And the, the conflict between it's kind of a, it's a simplification Protestant Catholic thing, and every twelfth of July, the Protestants would would put on lots of parades and kind of you know, show their supposed dominance and superiority, and and they would walk in the street. You could tell that you were getting close to that time when a certain section would start to kind of walking with their shoulders up and their elbows out, and uh, a little bit more of a yeah. swagger. And that was, my, that was my first kind of impression. Then traveling a little bit more around through England, mm -hmm. I thought, actually, there's a kind of like there's a New York walk, there's a London walk. Um, I think there was a Boston walk as well. Um, it's a little, little more uptight, a little, mm -hmm. straighter, little bit more contained, um, mm -hmm. a little less space than the New Yorkers. New Yorkers, you have to fight for your space. Um, and it, maybe in around uh, Liverpool, um, there's a kind of there's a very strong sea influence. So there's a little bit more of a, a roll to their walk, and you know, so with the, the whole kind of the Beatles and the and the, mu the the music is really important. So I do think different different cultures, different cities, different energies, um, musical influences, cultural influences. Um, have you come across Gil Hedley? Uh, no, I haven't. Gil Headley, a, he's a wonderful, really interesting guy. He does a lot of fascial dissection. Um, I've work. heard the name, but I'm not familiar yeah. with the work, no. Really, really worth checking out. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. That, no, I think gilheadley.com, H-E-D-L-E-Y. -E um, I was having an exchange with him about the kind of movement of the pelvis, and, uh, and one of his comments was, wow, it's like, I was brought up a Catholic. My pelvis just doesn't move. I wasn't allowed because it's 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 the seat of all sin, or not maybe all sin, but a lot of sin. So just we're in denial of the so the the, the pelvis. So you know, he didn't move his pelvis. So and that was a you know, that was a religious cultural influence. So we got so wow. many inputs, and it's you know it's it which of those inputs are going to be stronger at, for us an individual at any one any one time. So parental and teenage. Yeah musical and yeah singing, you know, it's like, yeah that's a whole oh gamut. just walking and that that's the thing that's fascinating about it to me is until i'd say fairly recently and, and i have to admit and i'm a little ashamed of myself maybe even just a few months ago i just took walking for granted as mm -hmm. just something we do now of course i realize some people have difficulty with it i've had you know, people I work with who are in wheelchairs who can't walk and they never will walk yeah. um, or they are very uh, on a on days off days and some days they walk a little some days they don't at all so that in that respect I didn't take it for granted but as far as how we move and rock walking it's interesting I hadn't thought about influences by family culture religion music yeah. yeah, I wonder, see, next month I'm recording a CD. Thank you for your support, by the way, for my, my pleasure. global project. Yeah, so we're recording a CD next month, and uh, they're all jazz musicians. Now I have to go and watch how they walk when I see them. <laughs> yeah. I, I was in the airport yesterday. I can tell you right now, just off the top of my head, they generally have a different walk than your classical musician especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
in you know it's all a generalization but generally mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting wow yeah. right, i'm going to start looking at this <laughs> <laughs> and an interesting question would also be nature or nurture do you does one get into jazz because that's a natural rhythm or do we develop the natural rhythm in response to being around the music that's a really good question and again it's probably there's no black or white there's no it's, no you know, nurture it's it's the whole combination that i think we just we resonate with with different different movement patterns different sound patterns different waves yeah yeah it's interesting i think um this has got me thinking well reading your book too well i don't read your book i study your book because this is this is a great book you know one of the things i love about it these the illustrations in here are really really nice um whoever did that did a beautiful job um yeah. you know the, the detail the attention to detail yeah and i'm yeah. a foot guy so hanging around dr emily for so many years and teaching for her i'm a foot guy all the way and yeah. But all these things are so detailed and nicely mapped out and the graphs and the charts. And, and then this whole thing about elastic recoil too. This is, um, yeah. get to hear, I love this. It really explains a lot. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to start working on the, the second edition over the next few months. Oh, so great. I've, I've just great. finished a, a chapter for a, an edited book by Robert Slipe. Oh, That's yeah. A, oh, wow. Yeah, doing, I love that guy. Yeah, so they're doing a, a second edition of um, I think it's fashion, sports, and movement. So I was invited to do a, a chapter on walking. Um, oh, beautiful! And, That's oh, uh, please keep me posted when it comes out because I, I'm a big James Earls fan and I'm a big Robert Schleip fan too. Yeah, yeah, no, he's yeah. such a lovely guy. His work is definitely, definitely worth keeping up with. Yeah, he he's, seems like he's a fun guy too. Uh, he is. Yeah, he's he's pretty cool. Um. So let's talk about this. I'm curious, how did, if you don't mind, I'll go into a little history maybe. How did you get into this whole movement thing? Um, yeah, what compelled, it was interesting. Like, what compelled you to do this? <laughs> um, I was a so body worker, and I remember I trained in structural integration with, with Tom Myers and Anatomy Trade School. And I trained with a, alongside a number of yoga and Pilates teachers. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd been a body worker for the previous 10, 12 years. And they were forever saying, Tom, you need more movement. You need more movement. You need to get people off the table and doing things. And I was a body worker. I was like, oh, shut up. It's like, just get them on the table. And, and you know, they, they need untrigger pointed and they need their fascia kind of mashed out. And they, so they, you're saying that Tom is saying to you, get people moving? I know the other, so the yoga teachers and Pilates teachers. Oh, the yoga teachers. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And Tom was treating people on the table and, you know, doing, doing some movement on the table, but, you know, it's all quite contained. There's only so much you can do on the table. Sure. And uh, so I was like, oh, what are these yoga people talking about? And the Pilates people, it's like, oh, we can do, I think we can do everything that we need to do with, with body work. And basically for a while I was teaching anatomy trains and kind of speaking that language every weekend when just training people and doing the, the workshops. And a number of people during the workshop um, said, oh, we say something about anatomy trains or fascia, and they'd say, oh, that sounds like something Gary Gray would say. I was like, it's the first time I was like, who the hell is Gary Gray? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the th third or fourth time I heard, oh, that sounds like something Gary Gray would say, kind of, oh, it re resonated. And I went, ah, I recognize that name, and that's, I, that's the third or fourth time, so I need to check. So I, I Googled who the hell is Gary Gray. And got all of this wonderful stuff, and I thought, oh, I, I need to check him out. And I went along to, what, um, I think they're still doing the workshop, Chain Reaction Transformation Workshop, it was in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And I, I sat in the, in the audience, and I, I, got, I got frustrated. I got almost angry because they were talking about bones and joints. I was like, I wish they would shut up about bones and joints, because it's not all about bones and joints. It's about this new fascia thing. It's like, don't haven't they heard? Oh my God, this is so old school. Um, and I, you know, it wasn't. I, eventually, um, after the third or fourth beer that night, um, I went. Actually, the stuff that they're talking about 
in, in, and they were particularly took, looking at the food and the mechanics and walking. Everything they're talking about correlates to all of the fascial stuff that I had been kind of talking about teaching for the last um, four or five years. But nobody that I'd come across had actually put those two stories together. So there was kind of the fascial world and there was the kind of physical therapy, physiotherapy, um, bones and joint world. So mm -hmm. actually, those two maps overlie. I know you've got a thing for, for maps, but it's like there's, you know, Tom had kind of mapped out the, the, the myofascial um, meridians and what Gary Gray had done is kind of mapped out the, the bone and joint reactions. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously those two systems have to work together. And so this was back in 2011, 2012. It's like, hmm. So I started kind of cogitating, thinking, well, nobody else is, that I knew of has kind of done that. So it was, it was kind of three yeah. years of experimenting and you know, making a fool of myself in the middle of the streets, kind of trying to work out what exactly was happening and kind of going through it. But it was, it was very strongly based on the, the, the Gary Gray kind of model of what he called the action. Interesting. You know, I've heard of Gary Gray, and I, I again, this is another person who I need to check out. Um, mm. uh, my friend Adam Wolf, and he's a PT in Chicago. He's the one who turned me on to Gary Gray. Yeah. I'll be seeing Adam soon too. Uh, but um, go give him my regards. I, I, pardon? Give him my regards. Did you know um, Adam? Yeah. Oh, he's fine. Great. He just bought a drum set too, so he wants some drum lessons. Okay. <laughs> So I go to Chicago, he's invited me to stay at his house and we'll jam. But I said, you got to teach me some stuff too. But yeah, yeah he, t he told me about Gary Gray and uh, some of the stuff was, so this is another person I need to check out. I'm, uh, yeah. There's so many people out there who are doing great things. It's, a, it's pretty amazing. So that's yeah. interesting. So then uh, what, was, what I, I love, actually I had a chance to interview Thomas Myers a couple months ago and that was, actually that was a lot of fun. He's, he's yeah. a fun guy. He's, very yeah. funny, very dry sense of humor. We had a good time. So you're the forward in this book, everybody, in um, James Earl's book, Born to Walk, which I highly recommend purchasing. Um, it's a great resource. So forward is by Thomas Myers. Really nice forward. Yeah. Um, where can people get this book? Um, well, the, the, the obvious easiest is Amazon. Sure. Um, but um, So if you have a good local bookstore, um, I would recommend using the good local bookstore to try and keep them in business because uh, uh, yeah. also has enough money. Um, <laughs> maybe has yeah, a little bit less. Do, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, um, so let's talk a little bit about um, some of the things you're doing. You're traveling, you, you lecture, you teach, right? You have courses you teach, right? Yeah, so there is a, uh, we have a, I have a three-day workshop on called, called Born to Walk. And um, it was kind of the well, way back um, three or four years ago when he started it, it was a summary of the book. And I don't know, you, know, you probably found it with, with writing any kind of syllabus. As soon as you've written it, so you've kind of explored it for a while, it's like you, you add in new stuff. Yeah, so, um, um, yeah it never ends. So the, the workshop is kind of a summary of the book and an expansion kind of update and new information and, and new exercises. So that's, that's happening. Um, through England, we've got a couple of workshops coming up also in the US, um, hopefully towards the end of this year, hopefully in, in Chicago as well. Um, so I teach those three-day workshops all over the place. They're listed on borntowalk.com. Okay. Uh, I'll put a link on the screen here. This also, the audio goes on to iTunes, but borntowalk.com, for those who are listening and not viewing, but we'll have a link on the screen too. So I'm yeah. sorry I interrupted, but... So we can find your schedule on there. Yep. And then I also teach uh, a kind of a standing functional um, myofascial um, um, body work approach called active fascial release. That's also a three-day workshop. Uh -huh. um, and in, in both of those, the, one of, the, one of, kind of the, the overall intentions is to get an, a better understanding of functional anatomy what I would call functional anatomy. Functional anatomy is not one of these words that's got overused and um, is defined by the person in front of the room. Um, so to me, it's, it's an understanding of the, the interactions through the body. It's like what should happen at your hip? 
if you take your hand over your head? What should happen at your foot if you turn to the right or turn to the left or reach forward? So it's being able to understand all of those interactions. So maybe some people refer to kind of the tensegrity of the body. And um, so we really explore into all of those, those interactions, which is something we got really strongly drilled in with um, the Gary Gray work. Okay, okay. Um, so your, your audience for the workshops, uh, this is, can you tell us who is targeted to it? Who can attend? This would be physiotherapists, I'm sure. Um, trainers, yep. personal trainers. Um, personal trainers, probably more so with the, the born to walk. Um, okay. Um, because there, there's less of that hands-on work. Less so, and so if anyone who has a background in, in hands-on work and has a license to, to touch, because I know that's, that varies between different states or different countries. Yeah. Um, so that one would be, so active fascial release would be very much um, for them. And Born to Walk is, is kind of a little bit of everything. So it's some of the theory about um, myofascials, skeletal dynamics, you know, what... What is it that makes us efficient? Um, breaking some of the, the myths about movement. You know, I don't know about how you were trained, but the whole concentric, eccentric contraction kind of model, um, you know, working actively across joints. Some of that obviously is true, but it's not, not how we normally go for a walk or how we do repeated movements. So with... For example, Robert Slipe's work with just understanding the the role of fascial tissues within within movement. So we got some of the theory, we got some of the assessments to see what's happening, um, and a lot of that is kind of the, to be able to appreciate the the interactions. Why is toe extension important for the hip? Um, you know, what, oh yeah, yeah. You know, um, that's a big deal, man. That's a, people don't think about it a lot of times, but that's huge. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Because um, then when you lose it, that's when you really feel it, right? Mm -hmm. In yep. a lot of places. Yeah. So we go through a lot of exercises to be able to kind of to to sense it in our own bodies, and then obviously assessments to be able to to look for it in other people. And so getting getting the kind of overall map of what I've called the the essential events, you know, what what has to happen so that I can minimize the work for the front of the hip, or what has to happen to minimize the work for the lateral stability. What has to happen to minimize the kind of, well, allow the rotations to happen through the body and to minimize the, again, minimize the work or make it as efficient as possible so okay. that you can, you can walk as far as you want. So let me ask you this. Um, if a personal trainer came to your course and they're mm -hmm. not licensed to do hands-on, like me, I'm not licensed. Yeah. Um, I would guess that I, I could learn a lot about all this stuff that, 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 First of all, it would help me understand a lot of relationships between different parts of the body, how one moves and how it affects the other, or lack of movement and how it affects. Um, and then when it comes to release techniques and all that, I can't do it myself, but I'm wondering if, if we can take some of that and use it in a self-administered way with our person we're working with. Yep. Take your so, knowledge that maybe would be used in a hands-on, typically setting, but use it in a self-administered way. Yep. So in the in the born to walk uh, workshop, we go through some of the kind of self self help exercises, okay. and maybe some kind of foam rolling or functional movement approaches, and and also just kind of being able to understand the implications not just for for walking but also for exercise. So if you got if you're giving um, a client lunge patterns um, for as an exercise, um, yeah, a lot of that, a lot of the, the principles still kind of overlap to the, the, the essential events for walking. So being okay. able to say, oh, okay, I might need to work on my client's um, ankle dorsiflexion so that I can properly load their hip so that whenever they come up with their arms or whenever they're lifting a barbell or whatever, that they don't feel the hinging in their back as much. Okay. So... so the, the workshop is kind of entitled Born to Walk, but it's actually, quite often I say, I'm, I'm actually not that interested in the walking bit. I'm interested in being able to see the whole body working as a system yeah. and being able to see those interrelationships. And we use the, the kind of the, the conversation about walking just to kind of contain it. Yeah. Because so, otherwise we can just, we could go in anywhere. And so we, we learn about walking 
but the intention is actually let's learn about the human body let's learn about how we really move in the world <coughs> excuse me well yeah i mean um i know part of dr emily's course that i i taught and i'll continue to teach uh, soon is is walking we we tell people walking is the most functional our most functional movement every day mm -hmm. for most of us that would be walking so yeah. when we're not walking efficiently efficiently and i would be an example of uh somebody who doesn't walk <laughs> as efficiently as i need i feel it in the rest of my body and it, it builds mm -hmm. up over time so i'm constantly having to do work yeah to try to get back to a more optimal movement mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah another yeah. thing too and i i i'm Anybody who knows me, they know I'm a very positive person. I'm a consummate optimist. I don't yeah. like to say bad things about anybody. So I won't say anything bad, but here's what I will say. Um, trainers, for, first of all, everybody who's a movement specialist, manual therapy, whatever, but trainers too. Uh, and I'm gonna say especially trainers in the United States, take time and buy this book and read it and learn it and then go to one of, um, one of James's courses and here's why I say this and again I'm really saying this because I care um, the standards to become a personal trainer in the United States are unfortunately very low even in some of the allegedly more respected personal training uh, certifications and education programs out there what you really learn about movement is very, very little. And I compare this to the first time I went to Europe a few years ago to teach. I was teaching for Dr. Emily. I showed up and I don't swear very often on camera, but I was scared shitless because these people came to this workshop. There were people from Norway, Denmark, Scotland, Ireland, England, and a couple from Germany and Slovenia. And man these people know a lot and they were personal trainers they weren't they weren't physios or anything the standards to become a trainer in england for example are much higher and it costs a lot more money and there's more time it takes to get in front of a person but man they know their stuff and that's inspiring to me so for trainers here in the united states you want to take your game to the next level and really make some differences you got to check out James Earls. You got to check out his book and go to the courses. Find people like this because this is the, this is the stuff. This gets into the meat and potatoes of this is the good stuff. You know, this is the stuff we have to know, and to not know it is to do, in my opinion, a, dis, a disservice. So that's my rant, but it's also really trying to support and show you appreciation for the work that you do. That's so important. Uh, I, I, everybody should know about it in the movement business. Well, thank you for the advert and the, for the. And I can say that about trainers because I'm one of them. You can't say it, so I'll say it for <laughs> you. <laughs> okay, and and I, oh, I know one of the one of the kind of values that Gary Gray had uh, whenever I was going through his training was it's like if people have a certain kind of understanding, it's not their fault. And, it's true, yeah. And it's, I find one of the one of the kind of things that, that pushes me forward to kind of keep me going out and maybe writing or running workshops is that there are very few resources for us to understand what I would call normal movement. Most of the textbook, most of the resources that we have, you know, available to personal training and, and trainers, to um, physical therapists, to even even to osteopaths and you know people with quite supposedly quite sophisticated training, they're still all built on single muscle theory, with muscles being the kind of prime movers within the body, and we haven't fully developed the resources for a more blended, interactive, tensegrity based, um, you know functional anatomy kind of uh, approach and um, we just yeah. don't have good resources yet and part of that is we don't have good re research mm -hmm. on which to build the resources you know that it always takes a, there's a you know 20 year kind of time lag for the the research to kind of tr build up enough to have the 
understand it's kind of worked its way into the into the textbooks. And whenever it gets in the textbooks, then it's probably still not understandable. It takes another five or ten years for, for people to translate it for us. So, so yeah. I'm hoping some of the some of the the current first edition and some, certainly some of the second edition. I'm excited to write the second edition because there's so much new material and you know that's just kind of coming out. And some some of it is just I wish I had understood those words when I read them six yeah. years ago. You know, over the last a couple of years I've been doing my own study and kind of going, ah, I didn't understand that when I first read it. Right, <laughs> I like, right. Finally, I can get it. So there's, there is also a, a maturation of, you know, the global awesome. understanding. I, you know, actually to hear you say that just, it, 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 that's so refreshing because even somebody, your level of knowledge, your level of experience, you're on a journey to learn and to understand better, to understand more. And so I also want to uh, just qualify something here too, because it's, it's possible I may have upset somebody in what I said a few minutes ago. I'm, I'm known to do that once in a while, but it's because I care. Now, like what you said made me think that I better say this. I know some really good trainers here in the United States. I'm just saying in general, your basic certification you don't really learn about movement. So those who know about it, they've gone to courses like yours. They've gone to, you know, different things. And they're the kind, they're, they're the people who are out there really investing in themselves and knowledge so that they can be better for the people they work with. And I commend them for that because that's, that's what our people need is the best that they can get when they go in for any kind of movement issues uh, or, or any kind of training. So it's, it's refreshing, though, to hear you talk about not under, understanding things differently now, the maturation process. And man, I, I was telling somebody the other day, if I looked at how I trained people two years ago, maybe even a year ago, I'd be embarrassed to show that to anyone. And yeah. then, I would have been, then I would have felt sort of okay at the time, but two years before that, I, so it's always this moving forward. Yeah. But if we don't do that, that's not good either. So I love it that people like you are moving forward all the time. So all the more reason to keep following you. <laughs> <laughs> so we can. Well, we have to, you know, I'm, you know. So I follow Robert and I follow Gil and other people, and you know, we're all we're all kind of, just kind of climbing slowly up the the hill towards some hopefully some great, at least greater enlightenment. We'll never get to enlightenment, but we'll yeah. get hopefully a little clearer as the as the mist kind of dissipates a little bit more. I think what I, I just caught from what something that you were saying there, and it helped me kind of clarify, the difference between learning exercise and learning movement, I think we haven't, we haven't separated those out. I think many, many trainings give a really good solid understanding and uh, safe application of exercise. Mm -hmm. And that's that's perfectly appropriate. What they don't necessarily give, and more, I don't think we have the good resources for. We don't understand movement. We don't understand what actually happens outside the studio, outside the clinic, outside the gym. Mm -hmm. It's like that's that's a big ugh, kind of black hole of of just well, we don't have a map for that. What the hell is going on there? So, yeah. and it's, it's one of the it's one of the wonderful things that we can come in and safely be put through very effective, good, hopefully well-programmed exercise. You know, that, that's a useful thing. But I think, I think even the, the schools that I you know, sometimes deal with, they, they don't separate out. They, they use the word movement. Come and I will teach you movement. It's like, no, you're teaching me exercise. Yeah. And it is, it is different. And I think we've gone the wrong direction. I think we've tried to understand movement by using the tools of exercise. And what I'm trying to do is, if, if we can understand real life normal movement, then we can better apply the tools of exercise. Yes. And, you know, so we can, we can tweak the exercise for you because my role in, in, as a trainer, as a therapist, whatever form, is to make you more successful in the real world. But if I only understand exercise and don't understand what you need to do outside, then I'm limited. I'm, I'm crossing my fingers and hoping 
Yeah. If I apply the shotgun of taking you through your program, I'm hoping that's going yeah. to help. That's a, uh, I'm so glad you said that. I think that's so important. Um, and I'll say in the, just in the Parkinson's arena, the one thing we want is when they leave, they can take what we do and use it in everyday life to improve the quality of life. And, mm -hmm. you know, but I wouldn't have thought of that a few years ago because I was a trainer and I was in a gym and we had our modes, our mode of operation. And, um, you know, you might have three or four hours in the gym per week. Then there's 160 something remaining hours yeah. <laughs> where you can screw things up or, or, or move inefficiently. Yeah. So that's, that's a really good connection there. I like, I really like that. That's something to think about. I think for all of us who are in the, the profession of helping people move better is to remember what, Try to help them outside the gym. What you do in can help them out, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, that's that. That's our profession. That, that's that's our mode of operandi. That's why we. Supposed to. Yeah, yeah. Um. So let's go back. Um. Just before we, before we sign off, um, just kind of recap some things. No, I didn't tell you I was going to ask this question. I actually meant to give you this ahead of time so you could think about it. So maybe I'll ask you now, and if you don't have an answer, I'll keep talking. But um, if you were to have, let's say, you've got this, um, a takeaway message for people. There's one thing you would want them to think about or remember, something to be mindful of. Is mm -hmm. there a particular message you have for all the practitioners out there, therapists, manual therapists, physical therapists, fitness trainers. Yeah, that's um, a loaded question. There might be more than one, so whatever you say is absolutely fine. I think just kind of to take it a step further from some of what we've just been been talking about. That's that mismatch between the resources that we have and the and the role that we have. If our role is to improve real life movement um, but the, our tools are those of exercise and our understanding of exercise is based on usually what Tom Myers would call single muscle theory uh, I do well you know I'll build my bicep I'll build my tricep I'll do my lats pulled on and um, is to kind of reflect on how do you move in the real world it's like just you know a, a workshop example I take was change the light bulb it's like Imagine you've got a light bulb emergency. You're standing directly under the under the fitting, and you need to change that light bulb. And if you just kind of throw your arm up to you know quickly change the light bulb, just kind of tune in to your feet and your hips, your knees, what's happening in your spine, and you know and it depends on how far you've gone in kind of shoulder mechanics. Right? Did you maintain absolute perfect scapulohumeral rhythm? As you made that movement, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what the hell is perfect scapulohumeral rhythm, and why is it so bloody important? Really, you know, and just to are we are we a collection of bits, or are we a, a complete working whole? Ah, uh, yeah. And and what what kind of you know the the kind of chaos theory, you know, the the butterfly flapping its wings in San Francisco and Shanghai or wherever, getting the tidal wave. And yes. you know, what are those, what are the, all of those other interconnections, all of the other variables, what all goes into just making up that movement? Yeah. And, you know, so it can be the, the physical interactions, but, you know, we also touched on earlier the, the emotional interactions, how you respond to a, a light bulb emergency, if such a thing existed um, today, um, you know, this afternoon, might be completely different from tomorrow morning. Yeah. I love that. I love that. It's great. There's so much we talked about here too, because that, that I'm still kind of um, all over the place with thinking about music and movement, emotions and movement, movement and emotions. I think mm -hmm. that's a circle that feeds each other. Yeah. But uh, society and movement, herd mm -hmm. mentality in New York City and movement <laughs> versus uh, the flowing movement in other areas. It's really interesting stuff. So let's do this before we sign off. Uh, again, it's borntowalk.com. Mm -hmm. So they can learn about everything you do there and they can get your schedule 
right? You have workshops coming up in many places. Yep. Yeah, and it's, that's kind of constantly changing, so always being updated. Um, I'm sometimes active on Facebook as well, so you can find the Born to Work page um, on face, Facebook, and also um, um, it's not. I I don't use Facebook for personal reasons, really. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm also on there. So both kind of James Earls, Born to Walk, and and also after fast release. So that's great. Uh, for the for the faster moving kind of changes, um, Facebook is obviously the, the place to to check out. But um, for workshops, then um, Born to Walk dot com. Great, to great. Well, better. this has been. Um, interesting thought-provoking inspiring i'm going to be thinking all day now i'm going to go have to go back through the book for some things that i've looked at before and see if i understand them better because that's that's what happens mm -hmm. I, I love it we'll talk about you triggered triggered a couple things today that now i go back in here if i think i'm gonna read them again i'll i'll understand differently probably in a better well I'll understand better yeah i love it man so james thank you very very much it's been actually my pleasure, Carl, and and thank you, and and I want to wish you best of luck with it's you know I I really hope that that all of the the part of this project just keeps on expanding and expanding because I, I think it's it is really important work that you're doing and that that is a it's an under underfed under under resourced um, field as well so the the work that you're doing is is actually awesome and, and important so thank you for that. Well, thank you. Um, I Normally, I wouldn't say anything on my guest's interview about what I do. I, I will just say that um, the Parkinson's Global Project .org explains what we're doing, the research we want to do. Uh, we have a university in Toronto now that wants to team up and do uh, some research with Naboso. So we're going to try to fund that uh, shortly. Um, but you know what it really is, is when I travel around, and I, I know you see this too, you see populations, I think, that are considerably less fortunate than what, where I come from anyways, in, in their lack of education and resources, and um, they need things, they need help. And a little bit can go a long ways. And when I say a little bit, it could be a little bit of money, but it also could, a lot of times, so far, it's just been, when I travel, it's just been... A little bit of knowledge mm -hmm. sometimes one thing can change a life you don't know what it's going to be all the time and mm -hmm. that to me is one of the most well the most gratifying thing ever it's uh you know i am on a mission i really want to make some a big difference as i say it ain't about me it's about we i'm just a facilitator i'm a vehicle i try to get things together and make stuff happen but you know your support is greatly appreciated um, and I thank you. Thank you for mentioning it. No, my pleasure. Thank you. All right, gang. Well, thank you again, James Earls, for being here. Remember, go to borntowalk.com. Check it out. Be sure to get the book. It's, an, it's a really good book, and uh, you want to have that in your library. So thank you. Have a great day, and thanks for watching. Thank you. Bye.